Hey everybody, welcome back to another round of astronomy, and yeah, let's get going. Displayed for you here is a lunar feature named Tycho Crater, and it's um, specifically, this is the central peak of a larger crater, which you can't actually see in the image. Now, if you're familiar, a lot of lunar features are named after famous scientists and astronomers. So you have, for example, a Copernicus crater, Tycho crater, etc., etc. This image was taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, sometimes it's abbreviated LRO, and a lot of its images can be found on the internet through NASA's website, available for free. It's because public money has gone into developing the programs, and so a lot of these photos you can just get for free online. So anyway, well, let's go ahead. We are continuing our progression of various models of the universe, starting off with the celestial sphere that came from the ancient Greeks. We then moved into the Ptolemaic model around the first century common era, where we add the idea of epicycles to explain retrograde motion. 100 or 1,500 years later, we have two observations, namely the maximum elongation of Venus and the phases of Venus, which are in conflict with one another when interpreted in the context of the Ptolemaic model. And so we have to refine, I should say, replace the model completely with a new idea of heliocentrism that is generally accredited to Copernicus. The next two people that we're going to discuss, excuse me, are together Brahe and Kepler. Now, we're going to keep the heliocentric model. We're staying with that the rest of the way through. But what we'll see is a further and further revision to the model. We're still in that philosophical mindset of perfect objects. Now, we know that the sun isn't perfect. It's got those sunspot, sunspot blemishes on it. We know that, okay, there's objects that can orbit Jupiter or, you know, objects that can orbit the Earth, but everything's still orbiting the sun otherwise. But we're still stuck on this idea that the orbits that the planets follow are circles, are still that perfect shape. And we'll see through our discussion that that starts to get chipped away as we move further into the development of astronomy. So let me give you an idea. Tycho Brahe, he was quite a character. Um, just to give you a couple of ideas, uh, he had a fake nose made out of gold because he lost his nose in a duel. Or for example, uh, he, we have letters of this where he's writing to an acquaintance and say, I'm sorry, I can't lend you my pet moose because he fell down the stairs and died from drinking too much beer. Apparently his pet moose would only drink beer. So one day he just got too much and, and that was the end of it, right? I mean, there's some other things. Uh, let's see, he was actually kidnapped by his uncle and then raised as his uncle's son. And of course, one of the other ones, now this one's up for debate, but there are rumors that what led to Tycho Brahe's death was that he was attending a dinner party and refused to ask where the bathroom was. So there's some rumors that there might have been some sort of burst bladder kind of problem. I'll keep, I'll come back to that one in a second, but all right, just quite the character. Now, uh, I've got a quote for you here and, uh, and I'll read it to you. Um, it's a rather long one, but we'll, we'll go through. So, on the 11th day of November, in the evening after sunset, I was contemplating the stars in a clear sky. I noticed that a new and unusual star surpassing the other stars in brilliancy was shining almost directly above my head. And since I had, from boyhood, known all the stars of the heavens perfectly, it was quite evident to me that there had never been any star in that place of the sky, even the smallest to say nothing of a star so conspicuous and bright as this. 
I was so astonished of this sight that I was not ashamed to doubt the trustworthiness of my own eyes. Now, what's he saying here? If we come back and go through it piece by piece, the first part is that he says, hey, I know my star chart. I have contemplated the heavens and I have learned the position of all of the stars, all of the bright stars in the night sky. But yet, because I know this, I know the star chart well enough that when this new star has appeared, I know that it ha- it wasn't there yesterday. It hasn't been there the day before. That star doesn't belong. Okay? And oh, by the way, it's not a wandering planet, right? This is not there one day and boom, the next day it's there. Okay? So that's the first piece. So I was so astonished of the sight that I was not ashamed to doubt my own eyes. The other piece of this again, is a philosophical idea. We know or we, the idea that the heavens are unchanging, right? And so what had not been previously considered is the idea that stars are changing. Now, in retrospect, we know exactly what Tycho observed. It's what we refer to today as Tycho supernova. Uh, the formal name is Cassiopeia B. And uh, so that's what's displayed for you here on the right-hand side of the page. Uh, incidentally, slight byline, when you see it, a picture in astronomy, you should always ask yourself what the picture is of. And more particular, what light has been collected to show you this image? So I've put in parentheses here, this is actually, if you could take an X-ray camera point it at Cassiopeia B, this is roughly what you should see. Okay. Now, what did Tycho actually observe? He observed a star which has gone supernova. We'll, we'll discuss what that means in particular later on in the course, but the short of it is that this star has exploded and exploded to a point where it destroys the star itself. So this is what Tycho observed. And all of a sudden, he has observational evidence that stars can change. They can, they can, you know, no star there, boom, all of a sudden there's a star there. Now, he didn't know that it was an explosion. He just thought it was a star. And later on, it faded out. I believe this one if I'm not mistaken, it was visible for like a month in daylight. That's how powerful this explosion is. So aside from knowing the star chart really well, okay, and observing a supernova, I'll start off with this. I think that probably the biggest contribution that Tycho Brahe made to astronomy is that he was an empirical master. What I mean by that empirical numbers. Tycho Brahe dedicated his entire t- career, almost 40 years worth, le- or 40 years in length, he dedicated his entire career to making accurate measurements. He developed ways of measuring the position of planets against the background stars. He developed techniques, he developed instrumentation to get the most precise measurements to date, okay? So he did this, he made 40 years of measurements. Other things, of course, I've already mentioned the supernova, okay? Um, He had this interesting thing, not only was he interested in planets, but he also measured the motion of comets. And here was another idea. He was able to uh, estimate the distance to comets. At the time, there was a debate about whether comets are something that occurs out in the heavens or is it something that occurs in the atmosphere. So when you see a comet, oh, some people argued, oh, it's just a disturbance in the Earth's atmosphere. It's not something that's actually out in space. Oh, nay, nay. Brahe was able to show 
that a comet was out in space in terms of distance measurements. He said, oh, based on these techniques, I can say that it's at least this far away. Okay. Now, the really cool thing was, and that, that's what this picture is supposed to demonstrate here, we have the Earth, we have the Sun right here, and you notice a couple of the spheres on which different planets are pasted. So this one would be Venus, this one would be Mercury, and right here, this sphere is supposed to be the comet. Okay. Now the problem, okay. Brahe saw the comet coming in, he was able to estimate the distance to it, and he was able to determine that that comet went through several of the celestial spheres that hold the planets. Now, again, we have to go back. Remember, from ancient Greece, when we say celestial sphere, we mean the ancient Greeks thought there was a physical glass sphere on which the stars were pasted. We fast forward to Copernicus, we still have this idea of physical spheres with objects pasted on them, whether it be the background stars or whether it be a single planet, Venus, for example. Okay. The only thing that changed there was that rather than those spheres being centered on the Earth, they're centered on the Sun. Okay. Well, what would happen if you take a glass sphere and punch something through it? The sphere should shatter. Right? You, you take a glass bowl, you punch a nail through it, the bowl should shatter. Well, Brahe said, wait a minute, this comet is like punching through the spheres. Why are the planets still able to go around the sun? If the, if the comet's punching through the glass sphere, that should break the sphere. And why does the planet keep moving? So I say broken spheres. And this starts to set an idea in place about how do the planets keep orbiting the sun, right? We have an observation that would suggest that it's not a physical glass sphere on which the planets are pasted. So that one will have to, to be continued. This is just the seed of an idea we have to go forward in time until we can get an answer, a better model for that uh, mechanism. Okay. I'll throw this last one on here. Um, even the best of astronomers in history still struggle with uh, accepting new ideas. So I give you this example more as a um, demonstration of how people have trouble changing their vantage points. So there was a Tychonian system. Tycho had his own conceptualization about how the universe worked. And it's, frankly, it's a, it's a bit of a hybrid between um, uh, a geocentric universe and a heliocentric universe. Right? So he kind of mixed the two. He couldn't get all the way to heliocentricism. So what does he have here? Of course, you have the, uh, the celestial sphere, the one on the far outside, and then you have all the planets. Sun is right here at the center. Okay? And the Tychonian system, what he, was, what he said was, okay, all of the planets orbit the sun except Earth. Okay? So all of the planets, the celestial sphere, everything orbits the sun except for the Earth. Okay? And then the sun orbits the Earth. So we have the sun here at the center. You notice that it's the center of all of the spheres. And then the sun itself travels around the Earth, which is this black dot, just slightly um, off center. He just couldn't get all the way over. It happens. Okay. Now, Brahe, an empirical master, he was able to collect data for over 40 years. He also had a protege who went by the name of Johannes Kepler. And so Kepler, his protege, had this wonderful comment. Okay, so we'll start here. But for us, who by divine kindness were given an accurate observer, such as Tycho Brahe, for us it is fitting 
that we should acknowledge this divine gift and put it to use. Henceforth, I shall lead the way towards that goal according to my own ideas. For if I had believed that we could ignore these eight minutes, I would have patched up my hypothesis accordingly. But since it was not permissible to ignore them, those eight minutes point the road to a complete reformation of astronomy. They have become the building material for a large part of this work. So what's he saying there? Brahe dies. 40 years worth of observation, Brahe dies. And there's a little bit of controversy around there. Some people, I've already mentioned, say, okay, it was a burst bladder due to a dinner party. Some other people say it was self-medication and he accidentally poisoned himself. Another theory, dun, 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 is that Kepler poisoned him. There is some interesting comments. For example, after Brahe's death, Kepler took Tycho Brahe's notebooks and fled. Okay, so that's always interesting. So, okay, so there's that. Now, we should say Kepler certainly recognized the importance of all the data that Tycho had collected. And in particular, these eight minutes. And you probably can guess, not time, that's not what we're talking about here. Where have you heard the term minutes in astronomy? Yeah, what Kepler means here is if I could have ignored these eight arc minutes. What I mean is that what happens here is that Kepler has a conceptualization of planets orbiting the sun in circles. He goes out and he compares his model where planets are orbiting in a circle to Brahe's observations and notice that the position of the planet, according to Brahe's observations, is eight arc minutes off from where they should be according to the model. And Kepler says, well, there are two options. One of them, we could just say, Brahe didn't do his measurements good enough, right? So, and sometimes that's the case, right? Oh, I just, I was lazy with my measurement process. I can just ignore the difference. It, it's an error in measurement. Oh, nay, nay. Kepler had such confidence that Brahe did his work precisely that he said, no, this difference between what my model predicts and what the observation is, that is a real thing. That is not just experimental laziness. And that is the key. He said, because I believed Brahe's measurements, I found a new model. Or maybe I should say, I revised the old model. Okay. You follow me? Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah. So, what did Kepler do? Using Brahe's data, Kepler noticed three patterns that the planets were following. Okay. And he said, okay, well, I see these three patterns. I will list them out. So, first law. Here we go. Objects orbit the sun in ellipses. Quote from Kepler. If this wearisome method has filled you with loathing, it should be more properly fill you with compassion for me, as I have gone through it at least 70 times at the expense of a great deal of time, and you will cease to wonder that the fifth year has now gone by since I took up Mars. Okay. Five years of working on this idea, this pattern. Okay. Second one. Instead of equal areas and equal time, I'll call it planets move faster the closer they are to the sun. It's not by accident that the closest planet to the sun is named after the winged messenger of the gods. Last time I checked, you do not want a slow messenger. Right? Yeah, good, good. Third law. The third law is, most, is probably easiest written as an equation. Okay? Now, do not fear, we are going to come back to this equation. We're going to jump over or we're going to go to observational astronomy and we'll come back to this equation later. Okay? 
but the third law is best written as an equation. If I take how long it, it, it's, how long it takes an object to complete an orbit and I square it, it will be proportional to the radius of the orbit. I'll put in quotes, radius of the orbit cubed. Now we'll set that aside. This is just for introduction purposes. We're gonna go off on a tangent for a while, okay? So right now we're gonna stop with the, the thinking about models, okay? What we're gonna do, we are now going to go through and talk about observational astronomy. In other words, the qualitative part of the astronomy. Okay? And we're gonna be using these ideas about celestial sphere. We're gonna be thinking about heliocentric model. We're gonna be doing all of that, but I wanna leave the qualitative section basically all together. Then later we'll do this slide again and we'll move into quantitative. So right here is our first equation that we get from uh, astronomy. We will then move into another personality whom you're probably familiar with that gives us several more equations that give us a way of more accurately describing the universe, namely Newton. Okay? So you'll have to bear with me. We'll go into observational astronomy for a little while, and then we'll double back to pick up with Kepler. Okay? Hey, I thank you for your attention. Keep up the good work. I'll see you next time.